All right, we'll open up to Genesis 1-1. Father, as we open up to preach from your word again today, we, we just ask that you would help us to understand what we hear and let it impact us, Lord. Father, these messages, you know, the preaching of the word is to edify, it's to build us up. And help us to be built up this day and help our understanding to increase. Lord, as we come together as a church to listen to your word, we remember those in the world this day that do not have the privilege or the honor of owning a Bible, Lord. They they would so desire to just have a Bible in hand, but they don't. We lift them up to you. We lift up to our brothers and our sisters that are being persecuted worldwide. We pray, Father, also for the furtherance of the gospel as missionaries go throughout our land and future lands. Lord, this land of ours needs a revival. We need your spirit to come to this land and to change hearts, Lord. We pray that this word that we hear today from Genesis concerning the beginning of creation is a word that will resonate with us and that we'll understand and we'll carry it out. And Lord, make us a people that goes forth with your word on our lips. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. So the title of today's sermon is Out of Nothing. Out of Nothing. And this is the second sermon from verse 1, and there will be one more sermon next week from verse 1 that will address God. It's been already, this is our second week in Genesis. Can you believe it? Time is just flying by. It's our second week. Today we're going to talk about time. So it's good that it's flying by. We're going to talk about time today because God in the first book, or the first book and in the first verse of the Bible, he actually creates time. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. In that statement is the creation of time. It's been a week since we last opened Genesis together. That is seven days. It is the same length of time that it took God to create everything. We will see that in the coming weeks. So Genesis 1.1 In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Last week I said that one of the first bold statements made in Scripture, if not the first bold one, is that there was a beginning. That's a very bold statement for many. In the beginning is the way that the Bible starts off. That's the way that God starts his word off. Now, God expects us to believe that sentence. He expects Christians to believe that sentence that in the beginning God created, as he does expect unbelievers also to believe that. Because it's something that's been implanted in our hearts, and it's been implanted in our knowledge, it's been implanted in the creation around us. All of this speaks to God, a creator, The first, the first thing he does is he says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. We're going to talk about two aspects of that today. The first one being that there was a beginning, and the second one being that the beginning be- came because God created it. So there are two things. The first one is there was a beginning and the second one is that there the beginning came because God created the beginning. Now, in this room I'll take a a poll, you can raise your hand. Who in here did not have a beginning? Okay. All right, good. I mean, there are no eternal beings in our midst, correct? I just want to make sure that there are no eternal beings. If you are an eternal creature, an eternal being, please raise your hand. Now, is anybody in here not aging? Okay. I mean, I look around the room, I see some aged people and some young people. Even Ken's got older in the last four years he's been coming here, you know? He's even getting older, right? Um, 
You know, I was looking at the news yesterday, every now and then, I mean, I don't even hardly look at anything anymore, but on the Fox News website, there was a little video clip that caught my attention, and the title of the, the clip was The Girl Who Won't Age. And it's talking about a three-year-old girl that has the body and the mind of a nine-month-old. And there are seven known cases of people that have what they call Syndrome X. Syndrome X. In 2013, there was a 20-year-old woman or girl who died of the same condition. At the time of her death, even though she was 20 years old, she had the body and the mind of a two-year-old, of a toddler. She had never progressed further than being a toddler, and she was 20 years alive on this earth. It's a very rare condition. Seven known cases. I started to think about that in light of today's sermon. You know, even though this 20-year-old died looking and acting like a two- or a three-year-old toddler, and even though the three-year-old yesterday that I saw in the news looks and acts as if she were nine months old, in reality, both of these individuals are in fact aging. They are just doing it ever so slowly. How do I know they are aging? How can I say that they are aging? It's because they live in time. They dwell in the fabric of time. So even if they do not physically or mentally change much, time is still changing around them. They are still aging. They may not physically look as if they have aged or mentally act as if they have aged, but they have spent 20 years in the fabric of time and three years in the fabric of time. We in this room live in time and time has shown its effects on, on many of us. But suppose we were able to reverse the clock, reverse the calendar, turn back the pages, and go back in the opposite direction from whence we have come. Suppose we could go back and see ourselves getting younger and younger. I mean, I'm about to turn 55, and I think about the day that Marilyn and I got married. I was 20, and I remember my sixth birthday party. It was a kind of a, a pinata theme, a Mexican theme. I remember that. And I remember going to Disneyland for the first time when I was five. And I have a few memories when I was three and four years old. That's about the furthest back that I can remember, all right? Because I have developed more over time. Later on, I might go be acting like a child again. But currently, I have progressed from three to 55. And I know as I keep going back beyond when I was three or four, when I remember nothing, I still had a beginning. I kept going in that direction. That's a regression. It's a regression back from 55 to 3. And it leads me to believe I had a beginning. Now today is Mother's Day. And if anybody in the room questions if I had a beginning, they are free to call my mother. <laughs> and she will tell you that, yeah, he had a beginning. He was a pain from the start. She'll tell you that, I promise you. You know, my mom is in her mid-70s now. She's, I think, 76. And, and I know she can remember back until she was about three or four years old herself. She can still recount living in uh, Georgia when she was about three, four years old. She remembers that. So we have this regression back in time. Me to my mom. Now... We keep going back in time. I mean, when I was an elementary school kid, Catherine Elementary, I remember coming home one day, the house just smelled like um, wonderful fresh baked bread, and I knew my mom wasn't cooking it because she didn't bake bread. And my great-grandmother, Hazel, was staying with us. 
Now she died in about 1974, but she was born in 1895. So there's a regression back in time. That's my mother's grandmother. And my mom knew Hazel's mom, Libby. My mom knew Hazel's mom, Libby. So I know Hazel, my, you know, Hazel Pleak had a beginning. I know that. In fact, you can go to the 1920 census records and you can see where she's listed. Okay? So she had a beginning. And her mother had a beginning around the time of the Civil War. So it's a regression. It's going back in time. I mean, Hazel knew her mom and her mom knew her mom and so forth and so on. Back and back in time we go. It's called this regression. It keeps going back and back and back until at some point we in this room, according to the Bible, we in this room discover we're all related. <laughs> Everyone in here is related. The Bible says out of one blood, God has made all. Out of one race, God has made all. So it's a regression back in time to the first mom. Today's Mother's Day, let us celebrate Eve, our first mom. But we'll just talk about her in coming weeks. We'll talk about Eve in the coming weeks. Now some listening to my voice might say, Oh, Pastor, I don't believe all that Adam and Eve stuff. You know, my ancestors came from the sea. And I say, in your case, I actually do believe it. The way you act at times, I think maybe, you, maybe your ancestors really did emerge from the primordial soup, or in your case, the primordial sludge. I hate to tell you, but even if you came from the sludge, that sludge had a beginning. Now, as we move through Genesis, you will realize I don't believe in evolution. I don't believe any of us had ancestors that came from the sludge. They came out of the dust. His name was Adam. Her name was Eve. Eve came from Adam. Adam came from the dirt. No wonder why women are always cleaning up after men. They're falling apart. <laughs> How do we know everything had a beginning? Well, we know it basically through common sense. In our minds we know things have beginnings. We also know it from science that everything had a beginning. Science tells us everything had a beginning. And scripture tells us everything had a beginning. Last year, Chris and I went and saw a movie called The Theory of Everything together. And it was a great story telling the story, a great movie telling the story of the life of Stephen Hawking. Stephen Hawking, for those who do not know, he's in his 70s. He's had ALS since he was about in his 20s, Lou Gehrig's disease. You will have seen him in a wheelchair, and he talks through a computer. On Dr. Webb's, on Dr. Hawking's website, now this man is listed as one of the 10 most with an IQ, big IQ, okay? Smart dude, most people say. And on his website, you can go and you can read some of the lectures he's given. And in one of the lectures he's giving on time, on the beginning of time, all right, he gives this long lecture, and at the end of the lecture, he makes this conclusion. He says, as part of my closing comments, the conclusion of this lector, lecture is that the universe has not existed forever. So here is one of the smartest men in the world ever saying, I quote, the conclusion of this lecture is that the universe has not existed forever. Rather, the universe and time itself had a beginning in the Big Bang about 15 billion years ago. The beginning of real time would have been a singularity at which, and listen to this, at which the laws of physics would have broken down. So I'm going to translate that for you. Right now we're going to ignore the Big Bang and the 15 billion years ago thing. All right, we'll address that in the day two or three of creation here. But I want to point out some things and I want to translate this. This is what Dr. Hawking's, one of the smartest men in the world, intellectually, has said. 
in the beginning, I'm summarizing, in the beginning, the laws of physics did not work. If you really boil down what he has just said, in the beginning when time was formed, the laws of physics did not work. Well, I have another way that we can say that. Let me, let me try this. In the beginning, there was the supernatural. What is the supernatural? The supernatural is something outside of the laws of physics. So Dr. Hawking's, if we just use some different words here, he's basically saying, in the beginning when time was formed, there was the supernatural. Now, I've got another way of saying it, and I'm going to say it the simplest way I can. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. God was the breakdown of the laws of physics. You know, God could break down the laws of physics right now. Right? I mean, he could. He could heal somebody physically. Yeah. Right? He could do that. that. He could break down the laws of physics. He could do the, what we would consider the impossible. He could deposit a big gold chest here, you know, full of tr precious metals or silvers or something. I mean, but, you know, he can do that stuff, right? So he is the supernatural. I mean, Dr. Hawking chooses to call God the breakdown in the laws of physics, but we just know him as God, all right? He is the supernatural. He is the one that created the laws of physics. He is outside of those laws. He's not governed by those laws. God is the supernatural. He is beyond nature. Being beyond nature means he's outside of the natural. And that is the only way he could actually create the natural, is being outside of it. Next week we'll talk about the transcend transcendence of God, how he lives on the outside of our universe. But yet, He's eminent. He, he dwells within it as well. In the beginning, God created heavens and the earth. Now, history demonstrates there was a beginning. Just look at history books. There's some time where they quit recording history. Archaeology, same thing. You know, you, the further you go back in times, the fossil record, the further you go back in times, you see there was a beginning. Science tells us where there was a beginning. Historians tell us there was a beginning. Cosmologists tell us there was a beginning. Archaeologists tell us there was a beginning. And our brains, <laughs> our common sense tells us there was a beginning. And scripture tells us there was a beginning. So what does it mean that there was a beginning? What does the word beginning actually mean? It's a Hebrew word that is being translated in our Bibles as beginning. Reset, reset, or reset is the word. Now what it means is when that word, that beginning, what it means is that that is the start of a specific duration of time or the start of a series of events. All right? And that's according to the theological workbook of the Old Testament. So when this Hebrew word is used and it is translating here as beginning, the implication is this. This is the understanding of a scholar. That when you see a beginning used by the Jews there, that particular word in the Hebrew language, that word means there was a beginning, a series of events, and an end that would come. So it's actually not only talking about the beginning, it's talking about the beginning, a series of events, and the end. So what that's saying is that in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. That means that the very first act on the first day, God created something that would end on the last day. I mean, it's really kind of cool. In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. In this first act on the first day, God created what he calls the first day. That implies, that word, that Hebrew word, implies there will be a last day. There will be a series of events that leads to that last day. So there is a beginning, the first day. There's a series of events that lead to and culminating with the last day. In Genesis, we read about day one. And in Revelation, we read about the last day. So there are two days in God's minds linked by a series of events, and he started all of that in process in the beginning. 
God set time in motion, creating the heavens and the earth on the first day. That's another way we could just translate that first verse. God set time into motion, creating the heavens and the earth on the first day. Some people say, what was God doing before the beginning, in all those years of time? Well, there weren't any years of time. He hadn't created them yet. God is eternally existent. Before the beginning, there was nothing but God. No space, no matter, no time. Before the beginning, simply there was, I am who I am. I am. Moses asks him in Genesis, asks the burning bush, well, who are you? What, should, what name shall I give to the Israelites? And he says, I am who I am. We get Yahweh from that. I am who I am. So before the beginning, simply there was just I am. That eternally existent one who supernaturally breaks down the laws of physics. Forever. He was. He just existed. Psalm 90 verse 2 tells us, Before the mountains were brought forth, or even you had formed the earth and the world from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. He was, and then he began something. In the beginning, God created. He created the heavens and the earth. Well, how did he do that? There's a Latin word meaning out of nothing, ex nihilo. He created it ex nihilo, out of nothing. Now, a lot of people cannot wrap their minds around this God creating out of something. I mean, out of nothing, something. They just can't wrap their minds around it. A lot of people say, well, you know, God can't create it all out of nothing. So they come up with all their solutions, like the universe spontaneously created itself out of nothing. Right? And that's their, that Dr. Hawkins would say exactly that. The singularity, the small point in time, just kind of created itself out of nothing. Like I said, some people consider him very intellectual and smart. I watched the movie and I thought, well, yeah, I mean, if you take God out of the equation and the supernatural, it makes sense. You know? But once there's a supernatural, nothing he says makes sense in a lot of ways. So they try to come up with these explanations. Yes, the universe did create itself out of nothing. Well, I would say that because the universe is very intelligently designed, then that nothing had intelligence and that nothing had power. Now you can call it nothing, I'll call it God. Because if your nothingness had intelligence and power, then his name is God. Okay? Me, I work for a living. I spend a lot of hours, I pass through the church, spend a lot of hours preparing sermons, Bible studies. I try to spend time with my wife and my children, try to take bike rides. I don't have all the time that these these guys at colleges have to do mental gymnastics. I just want something that makes sense really right out of the chute, and that is, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Boom. I can believe that. I don't have to do any mental gymnastics to try to come up with something that's different. You know, and every year their theories change. Every year they change. Stephen Hawking, I mean, a great guy, right? He gets his doctorate from Cambridge, proving one thing, and then he spends the rest of his life disproving what he proved to get his doctorate. That's the rest of his life. Kind of ironic, isn't it? The Bible doesn't change. We're talking 4,000 years. It hasn't changed since those words were written. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Where do those words come from? God. Who was at the creation? God. I think he knows. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. But you know what? We're never going to convince an unbeliever of that. That God created anything. 
And why do I say that? Because last week, Hebrews 11.3 told us, By faith we understand what was created by the word of God so that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. By faith we believe in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, ex nihilo. We, by faith we do that. So we can't expect those who don't have faith to really act upon their, their understanding. They just don't believe it. They, they, they see it, they know it in heart, but they don't follow it. We just can't expect that. I mean, God made new things. He brought into existence things that never... That's that word created there. It doesn't imply that he made something, changed its form. He actually brought about completely new things from things that never existed. That's what God did. The heavens and the earth are the things he brought out of what never existed. Ex nihilo. He knew Latin before anybody else did, okay? Out of nothing. Now... Those speaking the Latin language at the time, they actually had a longer saying that's out of nothing comes nothing. They understood out of nothing comes nothing. Well, unless God gets involved and then it comes out of nothing. God created everything physical starting on day one. Everything. Heavens and the earth. Everything we know. Everything man knows. He created on day one. All the physical. But when did he create the non-physical? the spiritual beings? It's just a valid question. When did he create the angels? Uh, I didn't have an answer to that question, but I thought somebody may ask it. When did he create the angels, Pastor? And I thought, I don't have an answer for that. I'm going to have to do some a bit of exploring myself on this one. So here's a good thing. If, if you have questions on Genesis and stuff, there are a couple, three, four, five good websites out there. May I list them in the bulletin? One is Answers in Genesis from KenNan.org. Great, great website talks about Genesis. CARM has a lot of good things on creation and such too. There are some other websites I'll put out there. So I started doing some analysis in my commentaries. I went out. Ken Ham had a, a great... Um, answer to this because he actually answered it for a kid that emailed in that had read a book. It was like, yeah, but when were the angels created Mr. Dr. Ham and or Kent? And to an answer that question, we have to think about it a bit. When did God create the angels? When did he create the spiritual world? Well, what we have to realize that unless the angels are eternal beings, they were created as part of creation. All right? Now, we know that the angels did not exist prior to day one. If we went to Psalm 148, we would see in verses 2 and 5 that God says that they were created. So, God started creating and he created time on day one. So the angels had to have been created sometime after day one on or after day one. He had to create them because they were non-existent, they're not eternal beings and time started day one. All right, so we know that the angels had to have been created on day one or after. Now, in Job we read these words. God is asking Job this very specific question in chapter 38. He's saying, now Job, were you there when I laid the earth's foundation? Tell me. If you understand who marked off its dimensions, surely you know. Who stretched out a measuring line across it? On what were its footings set? Or who laid its cornerstone? While the morning stars sang together and all the angels shouted for joy. So the angels were created on day one or thereafter. But they also were present and shouting for joy at the time of the creation of the earth. So, bottom line is, the angels were created sometime on day one, two, or the beginning part of day three. Because by day three, God has laid out the foundations of the earth. He has separated the waters above from the waters below, calling the waters below earth. So we'll deal with this coming up, but we'll just answer real quickly when the angels were created. Some were on day one, two, or three because they witnessed the creation of earth. Now, that being said, 
All right, they were created within a few days of man. And they fell away really quickly. Because by the time we get to Genesis chapter 3 here, we're going to see Satan, the angel that was put in charge of the Garden of Eden, the cherub that was designed to protect the Garden of Eden and man. We see by the third day, he's already gone down the tubes and one third of them have fallen. Because he's already tempting Eve. So, knowing that God created both the physical creation and the invisible creation ex nihilo, out of nothing, shall we ask ourselves how he did that? How did he create it out of nothing? And we don't have to go far for that answer because in verse 3 of Genesis, we will actually see how God created it out of nothing. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. How did he create it? He spoke it into existence. Hebrews has already told us that today, that God's word created all things out of nothing. And then there is Psalm 33, 6. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made, and by the breath of his mouth, all their host. The heavens, in other words. So by the words of the Lord. So bottom line, our Lord the Almighty God, the ever-existent I am who I am, at the beginning of time, created out of nothing those things that would exist. And he did so by speaking it. He spoke it. Creation began with God speaking. And you know what? You know what I think is so cool about this? What are we in this room? We are creations of God. How does he create us? Well, the word of God created us. What do I mean, the word of God? Well, we were born these fleshly carnal creatures, but with hearts of stone. But we have been created as new creations by the word of God. 2 Corinthians 5.17 tells us if anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation. That means a new creature is what it is. So if you are in Christ today, you have been made into a new creature by God. Yes. Amen. The old has passed away and look, what is new has come. Those who are in Christ have been born again as new creatures, new creations, by the Spirit of God and they have been saved by the Word of God. That very same word who created all things we physically and spiritually know. That word of God has a name. The name of the word of God is Jesus Christ, the eternal Son of God. And we're going to end this morning's message on the creation about the beginning by actually looking at another place in Scripture where the beginning is addressed, and that is in John's Gospel at the beginning. Because John's gospel, at the beginning, John tells us how things were created. So if you'd like to turn to John chapter 1, verse 1, I'll give you a second to do so. Because we're going to read about the Word of God and how the Word God created not only the universe, but how He creates you and I. John, so it goes Matthew, Mark, Luke, and then John chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He, became, he came as a witness to bear witness about the light, that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. 
the true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. So there, in the beginning, the Word created. And the Word is still creating all of those who are called the children of God come through His hand. Now at times I have wondered, and in preparing this sermon, I wondered once again, which is the greater miracle for God? Creating the heavens and the earth out of nothing or creating a saint from a sinner? I think the latter is maybe more difficult. Why? Because when he said, let there be light, light did not argue with him. When he said, let the waters separate, they obeyed him. But he says to you and I, to, to the unbeliever, he says, come unto me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And we say, no, we'll just carry our burdens ourselves. <laughs> we, see, we see him lifted up, and we, we hear that by grace we are saved through faith, and not that, I mean, and that not of ourselves, but it's a, you know, it's a gift not as a result of works so that none of us can boast. And we say, yeah, yeah, the grace thing's beautiful, but I think I'll do the works. Creation didn't resist him. We do. I think it is more difficult to create a, sen a saint from a sinner than it is to create ex nihilo, the universe and the heavens, out of nothing. But you know what the good news is? God has been changing sinners into saints from the very beginning of time we're going to see in Genesis. For God's word declares men like Abel, Enoch, Noah, Abraham, Lot, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, all of these men of faith we're going to read about in Scripture and in the book of Genesis, he declares them all righteous. Why? Because they were these good people? No, they were losers, most of them. I mean, Abel and Seth maybe are the exception. Everybody else was a big old sinner and just devious and, and liars and, and drunkards and all of that. But you know what? God is in the creation business. He created saints out of sinners by declaring them righteous. Just as he spoke this, this world into existence, as he spoke light into existence, he speaks righteousness upon his children. The same spirit, the same God. He declares. In Genesis, we're going to read about all of these men and we're going to scratch our head at times and ask, God, how could you declare one such as him righteous? Well, I propose we scratch our heads at the same time and say, God, thank you for declaring one such as me righteous. God creates out of nothing. He creates beginning for the universe. And then in this very room, he has created saints from sinners. He's still in the creation business. He's given every one of us in this room a new beginning. Yeah. And every day, by his grace and his mercy, we can continue in it. How do we know all this is true? Well, we know it by just looking at ourselves. We know what God's done. We know what he continues to do. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for creating time. We thank you, Lord, for creating this universe, for creating the heavens and the earth. We thank you, Lord, 
that you have created us as well and that you have cared so much for us that through your grace, through your mercy, through the word of God, through Jesus Christ, your son, through his sacrifice, through his propitiation on the cross, we are so thankful that the word of God has also spoken righteousness upon us and created us into new creatures. We thank you, Father, for that. We praise your holy name. We ask that we would be able to be a people that would go forth and tell others about the way that you have created all things and you're still creating believers from unbelievers. As we end our service today with one final song, Lord, we ask that we would be reminded of who Jesus is and all that he has done. And let us go forth then singing this song in the name of Jesus. Amen.